Hi, <laughs> it's Ross Kamich. I am going to try and share my screen so I can explain what I'm going to present at the World Conference on Lung Cancer. So hopefully you can see this. This is about a class of drugs called antibody drug conjugates or ADCs. And they all have terrible names. So this one is called Telisotuzumab Vidotin. The first bit of the name is an antibody and it tells you what it binds to. In this case, it binds to something called MET, which is expressed on the surface of lots of different cancer cells. The second part of the name, Vidotin, is the name of a toxin. So this is a means of dragging a cytotoxic, a chemotherapy, and changing where it goes to in your body. So what you're trying to do is give a bigger dose to the cancer cells that express the marker that the antibody binds to, and a lower dose to the normal cells which don't express the marker or perhaps express it at a lower level. So here, this is one of the, the more advanced ones in this field, TELISO-V for short, uh, being given to patients who express MET. Now, it gets rather confusing because people talk about MET mutations and MET gene copy number, but this is talking about MET protein expression, which can be downstream from those molecular events, but it can also exist all by itself. It's also a continuous variable. You can have a little of it or a lot of it. And one of the questions is, is there a level above which this drug will work and a level below which it won't work or it won't work enough to not make it attractive compared to alternatives? So I'm going to skip through the presentation and I'll give you the, the high level issues. So we often show on the left hand side here, this is um, patients who have different kinds of non-small cell lung cancer. Uh, based on what it looks like down the microscope, so squamous or non-squamous. And then within the non-squamous, they subdivided it by whether there was a known EGFR mutation or not. Why that? Well, MET has a certain proven role as a, as a kind of uh, partner in crime with EGFR, so they looked at that separately. And then because of that different levels of MET, um, they subdivided it certainly amongst the non-squamous cohorts by what they called intermediate or high. These are arbitrary terms that are somewhat based on a prior study that said levels above this are interesting. You were allowed in, indeed you were supposed to have had some kind of prior therapy, but not too much, about two prior lines of therapy, and you could not have a MET-directed antibody therapy in the past. I'll cut to the chase. So first of all, MET expression with the levels that they're calling positive, which again is in the eye of the beholder, was running about 25 to 40% of the cancers. Again, slightly different, but remember they're using different cut points. So in squamous cancer, where they used a lower cut point, 40% of people were positive. In EGFR wild type non-squamous, only 25%. In the study, you signed a form and your tumor was tested behind the scenes to see if it expressed the MET protein. And if it did, you were then potentially able to go into the study. What you can see is they screened 841 people. So they did a lot of pre-screening. The number of people who went into the study is only about 100. So not everybody who was positive either had progressed and needed to go into the study or they didn't go into the study for other reasons. I'll, I'll cut to the chase. So the table on the left-hand side this is the ORR, the objective response rate. So the proportion of patients who have shrinkage by more than a certain amount. What they wanted to do with this relatively small study was say, look, is this working in 25% you know, or more of people? And if you look down in the bottom line, squamous cancer, it was only working in about 14% of people. So it clearly worked in some people, but not enough for them to go forward with their cut point of just enrichment. If you look in the EGFR mutant population, depending on what level of MET they chose, they had about an 18% response rate or a 0% response rate. Now, they only had eight patients, but certainly not too encouraging. But I think they want to continue to look at this. One of the things about the EGFR mutant population is you have to stop your tyrosine kinase inhibitor. So you have to stop your osimertinib or allotinib or whatever. And there's a separate study keeping that going. Is that going to increase the side effects? Is it going to change the efficacy? So that question is still being answered. But this was the interesting thing. In what they call EGFR wild type, and let's be clear, EGFR wild type is not a uniform population. That includes KRAS and ALK and people who don't have a mutation and all sorts of other things bundled in there. But if you look, it was a reasonable number of patients, 37 patients. If you look in those with um, what they called met intermediate levels of protein expression, 25% responded. 
and the duration of response was about 6.9 months. Pretty good. If you look in the Met High group, now we're down to about 10 to 12 percent of lung cancer, a whopping 54 percent response rate. Now, is that going to be robust? There's only 13 patients here. It doesn't take many patients to make that percentage go up or down a lot, but that's pretty impressive. And you start to ask the question that maybe it's not about setting the level low and you know, having a drug that's going to work in one in five people, maybe it's going to be about shrinking the population that we choose to give some of these drugs to based on higher levels of expression. Because if something's really got a 54% response rate, that's worth going to the bank about. Uh, this is interesting. This is what's called a spider plot. If you look on the left hand side, these are the measurements on individual patients' tumors. You can see some of them are going up, some of them are staying stable, some of them are going down, and they're color coded. When they go purple, that's what they call an objective response. I want to show you a couple of ones here. Look at this. The reason it's important is when you give chemotherapy, shrinkage tends to occur relatively early and then plateau. But sometimes for some of these people, you get continued shrinkage over time. Look at this one. It just got like we're down out nearly 200 days and it's still shrinking. And that may be something unique to antibody drug conjugates. One of the ideas is this binds to these things on the surface of the cancer cell. It internalizes it and poisons that cancer cell, but then the sort of wave washes over and we have to wait for another dose of the drug to come in to hit the next layer of cells or the next exposure of new receptors on the surface of the cell to get another hit. So we may get slower responses in some people. And that certainly may be one of the reasons why they're just keeping an eye on that EGFR mutant cohort that's only running about an 18% response rate. Maybe it's going to change over time and just get above that 25% that they're interested in. Side effects? Well, you're delivering a cytotoxic. You might have a slightly fancier delivery system. So it's not junk mail, it's more like FedEx, but you still get some side effects. If I cut to the chase here, there's some nausea. There's some um, neuropathy, numbness. That's definitely a side effect from some of these drugs. There's some blurriness in vision. There's some anemia. So some of the things you might associate with chemotherapy, but it's delivered in a slightly different way, and it's certainly not as profound. This drug also does interfere with that MET signaling. And so if MET is actually driving your cancer as opposed to just sitting on the surface, that may also be beneficial. Hypoalbuminemia, that's lower protein levels in your blood. Um, and uh, peripheral edema, that swelling in your ankles, are both known side effects of inf interfering with MET. Some people have bad side effects, not many, but you can see that three patients actually died during the study and they couldn't rule out that the drug hadn't contributed. One of them was sudden death. That can happen when you have cancer, but you, know, you have to sort of be guilty until you're proven innocent. And there's a couple of other things, dyspnea, shortness of breath, and pneumonitis, that's inflammation of the lungs. And this can happen with antibody drug conjugates. We don't have time to entirely know why. It's possible that we have normal cells in our lungs that like to gobble up these antibodies and unfortunately end up poisoning themselves. The rate was relatively low, only about one in 20, but it's certainly known to occur with antibody drug conjugates. This is pretty at the low end of the toxicity, but um, it's something to bear in mind. The peripheral neuropathy, at least in my experience, is a sign of you've been on the drug long enough, which means you were probably benefiting from it. So it's a cumulative side effect. And sometimes you can stop the drug and the cancer will stay shrunk and the neuropathy can slowly recover. So this was the take home message. The dose, which is intravenous given once every two weeks was pretty well tolerated. It certainly had some efficacy, but I think we're starting to realize who it does and doesn't work in and what that level of med expression is needed. I think what's really interesting is trying to figure out who amongst that EGFR wild type non-squamous population that have high MET levels, but seem to have a high response rate, who are they? Are they the ones who actually have a MET exon 14 skip mutation or MET amplification? And then maybe we could get away with just a genetic test instead of a protein test. I don't know, it's pretty exciting. I'm sure antibody drug conjugates are coming soon. Thanks for listening.